Hey y'all, I'm Todd Clippard, preacher for the Burleson Church of Christ in Hamilton, Alabama. And thank you for joining us for this PTP 365 teen class session. We are studying the Sermon on the Mount. And today is the fourth in our series of studies. Our overall theme is called Walking Through the Mount. And we are, in essence, taking paragraph by paragraph, or taking our study paragraph by paragraph, by paragraph through the sacred text and gleaning as many lessons as we can from this great sermon. Uh, we're going to look at the subject of Jesus and the heart from Matthew chapter 5 verses 21 through 30. Jesus and the heart, Matthew 5, 21 through 30. So hope you have your Bibles open. Uh, I believe uh, there should have been a a PDF file available to upload if you wanted uh, to um, follow along and, and go with the handout that, that's been provided. And so uh, if, you, if you don't have that, you might want to pause and, and go back and, and pick that up or download it and print it so that you can follow along. But if not, we're ready to go. And I uh, hope you open your Bibles and read along with me in Matthew 5, beginning in verse number um, 21. Matthew 5, beginning in verse number 21. He says, You have heard that it is said of those old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of the judgment. Whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council, and whoever says, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar, and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. For verily I say unto you, you shall not get out of there until you have paid the last penny. And you have heard that it has been said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whosoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than your whole body be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than your whole body to be cast into hell. That's Matthew, 25, uh, Matthew 5 verses 21 through 30. I want us to think about the matter of the heart. And I want us to think of it in context of what we've been studying. Now, look, I, if you recall, I got things out of order the last two weeks. Well, kind of. I had a lesson on Jesus and the law, but I really wanted to do a lesson on salt and light, but I didn't have that lesson completely finished. So I went ahead and did the lesson on the law, then came back last week and did our lesson on salt and light. So contextually speaking, we're out of, or, or, or chronologically speaking, we're out of order. But contextually speaking, we need to remember that verses 17, 18, 19, and 20 deal with the matter of the law of Moses. And it's an introductory statement that Jesus makes concerning the law of Moses. And then this is the first in what will eventually be six statements by Jesus that Essentially say, you have heard it said, then here's what it, but I say. And so this is the first of, this is the first of those six, you have heard it said, but I say uh, statements of the Lord. And this one deals with the matter of the law with regard to murder and to adultery. Now, if you will recall, if you know, in Matthew chapter 15 and verses 18 through 20, Jesus said that murder and adultery and all types of sins originate in the heart. They originate in the heart. And so it's only pro uh, proper for us to speak in these, 
uh, with regard to this text concerning Jesus and the heart, because matter of, of murder and adultery are matters of the heart, and the matter of what Jesus expounds with regard to murder and how he expands the idea of adultery also deal with the matter of the heart. And so uh, with that, let's get into our study. Now, there obviously had to be Jewish leaders among the, the multitudes that had followed Jesus to this, this place and this time to hear this great sermon. Um, Jesus, I think, spoke expressly to the Pharisees, or at least about the Pharisees, in Matthew 7, verses 1 through 6. Uh, I think Jesus, uh, well, obviously we know Jesus was talking about the Pharisees in Matthew uh, 6, verses 1 through 8. And so with this, with this in mind, I want us to kind of zero in on the idea of the law of Moses and how it relates to the heart and the law of Moses and how it was applied in the days of the first century. And then if, if I don't forget, because I'm old and I don't have it written down, if I don't forget, we'll draw another conclusion with regard to ourselves and the New Testament. But thinking about how the law of Moses was given and then how it was being executed at the time uh, of Christ in the first century, um, I think it's safe to say that with regard to the Jewish leadership, there was very little thought given to the matter of the heart. In other words, the Pharisees, and then by extension, those who lived under the overbearing rule of the Pharisees and under the critical eye of the Pharisees, focused on the externals rather than on what is on the inside, rather than on the heart. I mean, we can see that you know, Matthew 6, with regard to giving benevolent, you know, our charity. We see it with regard to praying. Uh, we see it in regard to the things that people did in order to keep the Pharisees off their back. And so with that in mind, we see this mentality that all that can be seen is what's on the outside. And what is on the outside will either allow me to be accepted or will cause me to be rejected, cause me a lot of grief at the hands of the Pharisees. And so people had forgotten largely about the fact that the heart was the most important thing. Not that the heart was the only important thing, but that in order to do right in the eyes of God, whatever was done or whatever was said had to originate out of a good and honest heart. Uh, in Matthew 23, in verse number 23, you know, Jesus condemned the Pharisees as hypocrites. He says, you tithe mint and anise and cumin, in other words, spices. You tithe the tiniest of things. In other words, you are so meticulous that every single thing you have, you make sure you tithe. He says, but you have omitted the weightier matters of the law, such as justice, mercy, and faith. He said, these things you should have done without omitting the other. In other words, your tithing is good, but you've caught, you've caught yourselves up in the idea that your tithing is the extent of your service to God, and you've omitted things by, that cannot be measured by tithe. You know, justice, mercy, and faith. And, and so, so, again, that would, would have been common thinking obviously among the Pharisees, but also among the Jewish populace of the day. Now, let me go a little further. I think, I think that because of a lot of religious error being taught with reference and regard to the New Testament and the doctrine of grace, that some, and, and a misunderstanding of, of a lot of what Paul said, for example, in the book of Romans, uh, with regard to the law of Moses, that a lot of people have it in their minds that the Old Testament was a works-based covenant and the New Testament is a faith and or grace-based covenant. And I, I did a little experiment back in, um, oh, it's probably been at least 10 years ago now. Uh, I was in Ghana and, uh, and, and 
Look, I admit, I tricked them. I tricked them. I started asking a series of leading questions about the old, the old law, you know, the law of Moses, and, 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 and I let them right into my trap, and I got them all to say that under the law of Moses, you were saved by works and not by grace. I just kind of disengaged their minds, and I led them down this path, and they, they all affirmed that a man was saved by works and not by grace. And then I knocked them in the head with Galatians 2 and verse 16. That by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But you know, in our thinking, we oftentimes fail to, to consider or we forget or we don't stop and think that there was grace in the Old Testament. There had to be. Look, anybody who's ever going to be saved is going to be saved by grace. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't works that have to be done. Uh, works of obedience, works of God's righteousness, uh, demands and duties that, that fall upon those that want to and desire to be saved. But ultimately, we're saved by God's grace because it's through God's grace that we know what to do to please God. And so when the Jews were going through all their 613 thou shalt and thou shalt nots, when they were offering those sacrifices and whatnot, they understood, at least at that time, at least I hope they did, I expect that they did, that, that they were still going to be saved by grace, that what they did was not sufficient, was not sufficient to um, um, earn them or in any way merit them eternal life. And so, and so with, with that in mind, again, coming back to the first century, we have a, a, a serious problem here among the Jewish people. That, that they haven't they haven't given they haven't given five seconds thinking about their hearts all they're worried about is what is on the outside now even the law of Moses itself dispelled dispensed rebuked refuted the very idea that the law of Moses was a law that was pertained that pertained to salvation by works and not by grace even the law didn't teach that you know, hear O Israel the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and with all thy strength. Where did that start? All Love thy God with all thy heart. And then you have Deuteronomy 10 and verse number 12, which is uh, uh, eventually repeated in some way in Micah 6 and verse number 8. But in, in Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12, it says, And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. So twice here in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and chapter 10, we find, we find that, uh, that Moses is clear that, that the law of, that he had given them was not a law based in works. It was a law based in the grace of God and obeyed by faith out of the heart of men. And that's exactly what the New Testament law is. It is a law based on the grace of God, given by the grace of God, and obeyed by faith from the heart uh, of men. So now, let me. I said I was going to mention something later on. Let me mention it, mention it right now. As the Jews, I mentioned, you know, as the Jews thought that their law was based solely on what they did and not on their heart, we also have to be careful that we don't make the same mistake that they did. For example, if I, if I have it in my mind that I have to be saved because I've been baptized, I've missed the whole point. In other words, if I point to baptism and say, now here's the reason that I... Here's the reason that I'm saying I have been baptized. Then, then I've missed the whole point. You know, if I think that, if I think that because when I was in worship I didn't use instrumental music and I took the Lord's Supper every week and I was a member of a church that was scripturally organized and it taught the plan of salvation and they met three times a week and, and I point to those things as, as the, the the measure by which I know I'm saved. I've missed it 
again, I've missed it all together. I've missed it all together. Those are externals. Now, look, they're necessary externals. I'm not disputing that. I'm not denying that. But all of those things that we do have to originate in a heart filled with love and exercised by faith. And so as we think about Jesus and the heart in, in these two cases, we want to understand that Jesus is actually trying to get back, and I'm going to use a pun, a bad one, and I make, but I make no apologies. Jesus is trying to get back to the heart of the matter of the law of Moses. So let's, let's look at, at these, these two things here with regard, for example, to, to murder and to adultery. It says, You have heard that it has been said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders is in danger of the judgment. Now, I want to note that the text there is a quotation from the Ten Commandments, specifically Exodus 20 and verse number 13. Now, a lot of people who either don't know five cents about the Bible or don't care about rightly dividing the word of truth have taken Exodus 20 and verse 3, Thou shalt not kill, and applied it, to the death penalty. That you can't have the death penalty because the Bible says thou shalt not kill. And yet, the Bible uses and the Old Testament uses two different words in regard to murder and killing. In other words, not all killing is murder. Obviously, all murder is killing. But not all killing is murdered. The word there for kill means to, in Exodus 20 and 13, said it means to murder, put to death, or to slay. Uh, then in Romans chapter uh, 13 and uh, verse number 9, uh, the commandments are listed, and, and the word there that is used from the Greek means to smite with the intent to kill. Okay? And so, and so, Kill may have been a somewhat accurate rendering in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not kill. I think the Jews, obviously they understood what that word meant. I think for us today we would do better to say, Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not murder because that's actually the intent of, of, the, of the command and, and the use of that word. And also... I think when if people would just stop and for about five seconds and think, all right, now the, the Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not kill. And yet, there must be 30 different laws that a Jew could break that all required the death penalty. So does that, does that mean, that, does that, mean that, that God is inconsistent? Does that mean that God's word contradicts itself? That it says one thing in one place and, and the opposite thing in another place? Well, well, no. For example, in Exodus 22 and verse uh, 24 and Leviticus 20 and verse 16, the, the Hebrew word uh, means to smite with the intent to kill, but it is used in the context of the execution of judgment. The execution of judgment. And so, so all the passages, the, the, the passages that, that command the death penalty do not use the word for murder that we find in Exodus 20 and verse uh, number 13. Then other words that we find in our Old Testament, the word, I think it's muth, and I may not be pronouncing that, that properly, but, but it's translated put to death. It means one who must die or one who is worthy of death. So obviously the death penalty is enjoined, that is, it's, it's authorized by the Old Testament, and yet the Old Testament, the old law of Moses, also said, thou shalt not, thou shalt not kill. And so I, want to, I just want to make this clear in your mind, that, and we could even use New Testament examples where, where Paul said, if I've done anything worthy of death, I do not hesitate to lay down my neck. You know, the New Testament, uh, Romans, thir ter Romans 13, uh, authorizes the, the, uh, the civil government to, to practice the death penalty. He does not bear the sword in vain. So the Bible enjoins the death penalty, right? but the Bible also forbids murder. 
And so therefore, it is not murder to practice the death penalty. Because in, where there is the death penalty, there is a guilty party. Where there is murder, there is an innocent party that loses his or her life. So now, moving on to, moving on to how Jesus kind of stretches this thing out a little bit. You've heard it's been said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, that whoever's angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, now that, boy, Raka, what does that mean? Yeah, that, in other words, it's almost like there's a, there's a word there that's, that's not been translated because there's not a, there's not a rock. I don't think there's a rock guy in the English language. So what does that mean? What does rock guy mean? How come somebody didn't, didn't translate that? Well, I can't translate it for you either. <laughs> not in English, so to speak, and maybe not in a single word. But uh, in my 14 trips to Ghana, I picked up on a little bit of the local Ghanaian language. There are about four major languages in Ghana, and, and some of them are quite similar. A tree and a Khan, a Fanti, you know, these languages are somewhat familiar and are, are similar. And so, as you know, when you travel, you, you want to try to learn some of the local language for your own benefit. And also to, to show respect to the people that, that you're, you're among. Look, I, I think enough of you that I'm trying to learn some of your language. Well, you know, we developed some great friendships in Ghana. Some of the best I've ever had are, are guys from Ghana. In fact, I've been corresponding with one of my dearest friends uh, from Ghana just this week. And, uh, but uh, when he calls me or I call him, we always talk in his language and not mine. Uh, just for the pleasantries, because I can't, I can't speak that language, and he can speak English quite fluently. But in any event, we learned, we learned a Ghanaian insult. All right, and this Ghanaian insult fits the word raka perfectly. And the Ghanaian insult is wuti awu, wuti awu, wu w o is you. T, T-I, means understanding. Awu means has disappeared, has gone away. And so, uh, and so when you, so when we would be with our, and by the way, we wouldn't just say this to anybody. We would only say it among our friends, ourselves, because we knew, because it was an insult, but it, like we, you know, we use insults all the time among our friends. And so, wuti awu, your understanding is gone. You can't understand anything. In other words, you're, you're brainless. So, wuti awu corresponds to raka. And so what Jesus, Jesus is saying here, that whoever says to, to his brother, you are mindless. You, ha you have no understanding whatsoever. He's in danger of the council. And then whoever says to his brother, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Now that word fool, and then again, the word fool and foolish is found in a number of different contexts in, in the New Testament. For example, uh, Paul wrote, O foolish Galatians. So was Paul in danger? Was Paul in danger of hellfire for, for saying that the Galatians were foolish? If, if, if this text says, thou, if you say to your brother, thou fool, you're in danger of hellfire? Or what about the, the what about the, uh, of the parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 12 when he said of the rich but foolish farmer he says take thine ease eat drink be merry you have much goods laid up for many years and Jesus said and that man to him to that man it will be said thou fool thou fool tonight your soul is required of you then whose will these things be which you have provided and so, again, we have to understand these things contextually. Uh, my understanding of the word fool here means to identify a person as being beyond the reach of the grace of God. Uh, some of my Bibles have, as a margin note, where it says fool, a graceless wretch. In other words, somebody who has no, no hope, of they're, they're so wretched that there's no hope of grace that grace can even reach them. And so what's Jesus really talking about? He's talking about not murder, but our attitudes towards our brethren. 
And by the way, we get to the end of the New Testament. We get to the book of 1 John and get to chapter 3. And John said, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Isn't that interesting? How Jesus used these words in this context with, with our attitudes towards our brother in the context of murder. And then John kind of turns it around and talks about our attitude, uh, uh, our, our hatred toward our brother is what? Murder. And he says, you know, no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And so there, there's the context of Jesus and the heart with regard to murder. But then you have the second, you know, Jesus says, you shall, you have heard it's been said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whosoever looks upon a woman to lust after her in his heart has committed adultery with her already, already. So again, the Pharisees would have been focused on the deed of adultery, whereas Jesus would be focused on the design of adultery. In other words, that it begins in the eyes, in the, in the mind, and in the heart. And so Jesus is, obviously, the, the New Testament condemns adultery. But the New Testament also condemns the attitude of heart that leads to adultery. And that if one desired adultery, but could not commit adultery... In the eyes of God, that individual would still be guilty of adultery, of committing adultery in his heart. And so that's why we have to guard our, we have to guard our hearts. We have to guard our eyes. And Lord willing, when we get to Matthew chapter 6, um, we're, going, we're going to talk a lot about, I think we talked a little bit about this in our section on the Beatitudes about being pure in heart because of what gets in our eyes gets in our heart. But as, you know, as we think about uh, the danger of adultery, you know, First Peter uh, uh, chapter two and about verse fourteen, I think it is. Peter says they have eyes full of adultery, and cannot cease from sin. And so Jesus dealing with adultery not as a matter of the body, but as a matter of the mind and of the heart. So, in conclusion, just uh, uh, four quick points that, for for your consideration. Both the law and the gospel are founded on matters of the heart. Number two, one cannot hate his brother and go to heaven any more than he can kill his brother and go to heaven. One can no more lust after a woman and go to heaven than to commit adultery with her and go to heaven. And then as we made mention in Matthew 15, Jesus will later more concretely formalize uh, the matter of the heart. And so I think this is a, a great lesson for us. Look, this is a great lesson, I think, not just for young people, but for, for everyone that we need to be, you know, we need to guard our heart. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse number 23. And that's going to bring us to a close this week. Uh, Lord willing, next week we'll look at Jesus and marriage from verses 31 and 32. And But uh, that's going to... Uh, tie us up for, for close us out for this week. Thank you so much for being a part of our Bible study this week. Hope it's been a blessing to you. Hope you've learned a lot. I always learn a lot in my, in my study and preparations. And if the Lord wills, uh, we'll be back at the same time uh, next Lord's Day morning. I think they're featuring them again at seven o'clock central time each uh, Sunday morning. But obviously they're available anytime that uh, you want to watch these. And we're, we're thankful for uh, the folks at Jacksonville and PTP 365 for making these available to everyone. So I uh, hope you have a great, if you're watching this on, on, on Sunday morning, I hope you have a great Lord's Day morning and a great week. And if the Lord wills, we'll see you back at this same time uh, next Lord's Day morning. Again, thank you for watching. God bless you.